First of all, I would like to thank and say that I'm very honored to be uh, giving a lecture here at the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. So I would like to thank the people from the Pushkin Museum who invited me to do so. I would also like to thank Eshkolot for inviting me to come to Moscow. There is also the British Council that has a great uh, hand in having the Pre-Raphaelite exhibition here in Moscow. And finally, last but not least, the organization of Avichai in Jerusalem, in Israel, who was responsible for bringing me over here. So first of all, the first Pre-Raphaelite group were, was uh, made of five students from the Royal Academy in London. And as you can see, they were very, very young people. This, the first one was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and then John Everett Millet, William Holman Hunt, William Michael Rossetti, who is the brother of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, James Collinson, and Frederick George Stevens, and Thomas Woolner. And they wanted to do something that was, in a way, against what they were studying at the Royal Academy in London. So of course, in the beginning, I would like to say just the general things. Why are they called the Pre-Raphaelites? They wanted to be, to go back in the history of art to Pre-Raphael, or to the age before Raphael. And I'm going to show you, just to remind some of you that probably know Raphael, at least three paintings that are very famous of Raphael, who was one of the great, of the four, uh, great uh, painters of the High Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael Sanzio, Michelangelo Buonarroti, and Tizian, that you have a beautiful exhibition right now at the Pushkin Museum. What they wanted to do was to go back, as I said, to the age before Raphael, maybe to the early Renaissance or to the late Middle Ages, and not paint like Raphael, because Raphael was uh, the most uh, honored and the most uh, looked after and the most revered painter for the Royal Academy, not only in London, but also in, uh, in uh, Germany and also, I believe, in Russia. So what I'd like to say today to you, after just saying this little short introduction, is that when you talk about the Pre-Raphaelites in England, you cannot but mention the name of John uh, Ruskin, the philosopher and the esthete and the, also the very good artist. So I will be saying a few words about Ruskin and then I will talk to you just for a little while about a group of other artists are called the Nazarenes and I will also talk to you about how the Pre-Raphaelites are part of the general phenomenon of Orientalism and the last thing I would see, I would mention with the Pre-Raphaelites before we go to the Holy Land is their belief that they have to do truth to nature. So let's meet for, for a very f short uh, time some of the Nazarenim. The Nazarenim were a group of German artists who left Germany, came to Rome, and they wanted to create new, and what they thought at the beginning of the 19th century would be new modern religious art. And you can see now that they were going back to artists like Ghirlandaio that you see here, who was from the 15th century in Italy. And this is another one of the Nazarenim, uh, who is uh, uh, Overbeck. And you can see now that uh, I make a, a comparison maybe between Mazzolino, who was a 15th century artist in Florence in Italy, and on the left you can see the a drawing uh, by uh, one of the Nazarenim that you can see on the left, and you can see certain things that he's taking, the composition or the, the perspective drawing that he's taking from the early Renaissance artists in Florence. But these Nazarenes, at the beginning of the 19th century, they wanted to create the new, as I said, the new modern art, a religious Christian art, 
And this is what Raskin had to say about them. And if you look at the texts that you have in your hands, this is text number two. I would read it in English and you can see it in your texts. The modern religious religionists of the school of Overbeck are just like people who eat slate, pencil, and chalk and assure everybody that they are nicer and purer than strawberries and plums. So you can tell that uh, Raskin is not exactly loving the Nazarenes and, they say, and he says that they're very dry in their painting. So this is John Raskin that you see here, that one of the pre-Raphaelites, John Everett Millet, painted his uh, uh, portrait. And just to give you another example of somebody else that is also trying to make modern uh, religious art is uh, uh, the Russian artist that you can see. Most of his paintings at the Tretyakovskaya Galeria here in uh, Moscow, and this is uh, Polenov. And the interesting thing is that this is the same subject that we saw that uh, Overbeck was doing. So if we look at Overbeck and you look at Palenov, it's completely different. Palenov does not want to go back to the early uh, Renaissance. And you can see that he was really in Jerusalem and I'll come back to it a little later on. So just one last example to show you what the Royal Academy in England at the same time that the Pre-Raphaelites were painting their new and uh, avant-garde paintings, as we call it avant-garde now, they were not called avant-garde in those days, but this is a, a British artist called Hayden, and you can see that in this painting he's very much like Raphael in the style and the composition. And even if we look at something like this that you also have here in Moscow, you can tell that even this uh, Russian artist was very much like Raphael, and if, if you go to the, to the Tretyakovska Galeria to see this painting as I did yesterday, you could tell that the composition and the way he is treating the figures or the human figures in this painting is very much like Raphael. Okay. And the next thing that I wanted to tell you is uh, the uh, great love and the admiration of the Orient in the middle of the 19th century. The love of the Orient didn't start in the 19th century. If we go back to 15th century Italy or to the 16th century, we know that certain artists wanted to paint the Orient, but they have never been there. And one case is, for example, Gentile Bellini that uh, did a painting that's supposed to be taking place in Cairo, in Egypt. The only place in the Orient that uh, this Gentile Bellini ever visited was uh, Constantinople or Istanbul at the time because he was invited by the, uh, the ruler of Istanbul at the same time to come and make his portrait, the Sultan there. And when we come to the 19th century, I'm just trying to show you the interest in the Orient, but uh, you will see in a minute that not most of the, uh, not very many artists did go to the Orient. So they had some kind of a vision of what the Orient is all about. And this uh, French painter, Gros, uh, is painting a documentary painting about uh, a documentation of Napoleon in Jaffa, or in Jaffa, in the Holy Land. And you can see that the, the, the theatrical set behind him, Gros was never in Jaffa and was never in the Holy Land, but he could have his fantasies of what the Orient really looks like. So now let's come to the Pre-Raphaelites and the other Orientalists who are coming to the Holy Land. And I just wanted, I'm showing you a map here just to tell you how they came. So if they came from England or from France, most of them came to Istanbul and first to Greece and then to Istanbul. And from there they could take a boat either to uh, Jaffa in uh, the Holy Land or they can take a boat to Alexandria, they can go to uh, Lebanon or they can go uh, also from Greece to Alexandria and if they came from Russia, I would say that the shortest way would be to go to Istanbul through the Black Sea and then come to either Lebanon or to uh, the Holy Land. So you can see that it was a very adventurous way to do it. If you think about the, the middle of the 19th century, there were hardly any trains, definitely not in the Holy Land. So everything had to be done with camels or everything had to be done by foot. 
in how to come to the Holy Land or how to come to the Orient, there were certain books in the, mid, in the middle of the 19th century, and you can read, uh, you can read them here on, on, the, on the screen. And I can tell you that at least one of them was translated into Russian. And the first place they came was, let's say, Egypt. And if they came to Cairo or they came to Alexandria, it was a great place for them to be because you can see how the dining room in the hotel, the Shepherd's Hotel in uh, uh, Cairo really looked like. And this is the balcony. So these uh, pre raphaelites at least two of them, one of them is William Holman Hunt, which we will come to in a second, and Thomas Seddon, set together in 1854 to come to the Holy Land and the first station or the first stop on their way was Alexandria and then Cairo. So I'm just showing you two, uh, uh, three um, drawings in watercolor just to let you know how they uh, get the impression of the Orient. One other thing that one has to say that in this uh, time there already were photographs of the Orient. They were very, very popular and they were sold all over Europe as a great uh, uh, discovery of the Orient. So this is one of them. So here is uh, uh, a watercolor drawing by Thomas Seddon. You can see that he went to visit the most famous uh, tourist attraction even today, the great Sphinx in uh, Giza next to Cairo. But, he, but the same place, he went with William Holman Hunt. And if you look at the two drawings that I'm showing you, you can tell that there are two different people. This is by Sedun, and uh, the other he... one is by Hunt. This is Holman Hunt. And you can see that Holman Hunt always looks at nature and always gives a very, very direct and very uh, adequate uh, description of nature, but always puts something symbolic in it. And what I'm talking about is the, is the snake here that you can see. Mm -hmm. Sedon doesn't do that. So you see the two of them coming to the east and from Egypt, they took a caravan, <clears throat> they took uh, uh, camels and they had to have guides to take them because they did not speak Arabic and they take the trip all the way to the Holy Land. Another artist that came, who came there is better known for his poetry rather than being an artist, and this is Edward Lear. But I'm leaving, it, I'm leaving him for the time being. I just wanted to show you what kind of places they went to in the Holy Land, and there are remote places in the desert, very dangerous, very adventurous, and very far away from uh, urban civilization. And just to let you know how difficult it was to go there, I'm showing you what this place looks today. And this is exactly the same place that Edward Lear was, and it's called Metzada or Masada in Israel. And you can see that the modern way for tourists to go there is they have all these stairs built for them so they don't have to climb it by foot. And just to give you two more examples of how other artists, besides the Pre-Raphaelites, came to the Holy Land. They came and they were looking for religious places. And of course, they painted churches, but they also painted the Western Wall, which is uh, an ancient uh, remain of the temple in Jerusalem that is holy for uh, the Jews. Two more examples, and I'm finally coming to William Holman Hunt. I'm sorry it's taken me so much for the introduction, but I wanted to show you two things. This is a painting that you can see in the exhibition in, uh, uh, at the Pushkin Museum, at the Pre-Raphaelite exhibition. It's by William Dice, an English painter who was not a member of the Pre-Raphaelites, but it, he was admiring the Pre-Raphaelites and tried to work in their style. And again, if you go to the, uh, here in uh, Moscow, you can see almost the same subject by a Russian artist. So both artists, both the Russian artist and the English artist were trying to do new and modern religious art with the figure of Jesus sitting and contemplating in nature or in the desert maybe. But if you look very carefully, the desert on the right is a landscape from Scotland and the desert on the left is someplace in Russia. 
And this is exactly what Ruskin and the Pre-Raphaelites tried to change. And what the Pre-Raphaelites, or at least two of them, this William Holman Hunt and Thomas Seddon tried to do, was to go to the Holy Land, not only because they wanted to visit the Holy Land just to see the religious places or the holy places, but in order to make a new kind of landscape painting that would be, or that would give the, 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 the straightest idea of the landscape in which Jesus lived and preached. Okay, and uh, one thing that Ruskin advocated for painters, he was very much concerned with modern religious painting. And in order for him, in order to have a new and modern religious painting, Ruskin was talking about light or the uh, description of light in painting. And one of the things that I'm sure all of you will agree with me, the way to describe or the way to depict light in painting is definitely by the use of color. And Ruskin was advocating for modern painters to use or to, to devote a lot of their time and a lot of their attention and a lot of their work to the description of light. So if you look at the text number seven that you have in, in your handouts, I will read to you just one little thing, but uh, you can see the whole thing if you read it. And this is what Ruskin says. God has, this is text number seven. God has employed color in his creation of the, uh, as the, I'm sorry, as the unvarying uh, accompaniment of all that is purest, most innocent, and most precious. And Raskin was very much influenced, again, by uh, late Renaissance painting, like the one I'm showing you here by a, a, a Renaissance artist. And you can see, what I'd like for you to see is the detail of the rising Jesus. And I want you to look at the sky or at the, at the description of the, the colors of the sky. And one of the things you can tell here that there are four basic colors that uh, Ruskin really loves and advocates all the time. This is blue and crimson or red, some kind of red. This is white and this is gold. Okay, so I had the number seven already, that's okay. Ruskin also goes to the Bible. And uh, if you look at your text, I mean, this is a long text that I don't have time to read all of it, but if you look at the, at the text number 10, I can read it, uh, shall I read it in Hebrew? Okay, so he, he goes to the Bible, and of course Ruskin didn't read it in the Hebrew, but I can read it in Hebrew for you, and he's talking about colors, and one of the things he says, zahav <laughs> <clears throat> or in other words, he was talking about the costume of the high priest in the temple. And the costume of the high priest was exactly these four colors, blue, white, crimson, and gold. Okay. And this is what Ruskin says. So you see these four colors, and I'm not saying it just for nothing, because you will see it later on as the uh, Pre-Raphaelite artists are really going uh, according to what Ruskin had to say. And Ruskin was also admiring this particular painting by Titian, it's called Noli Metangere, and you can see Mary Magdalene and uh, a Jesus, and you see in this painting exactly these four colors. You can see the red color of the Magdalene, you can see the white and blue of Jesus, and you can see the gold in the sky and the blue in the sky. So this is uh, something else that is very important because Ruskin is not only talking about God's colors, he's also talking about the symbolism of transformation or the transformation of colors from red or from purpur to white. And this is from sin to purity. So I hope you remember all these things because once we finally come coming to William Holman Hunt's paintings, you will see it there as well. And this is an example of a painting or a, a watercolor drawing by Ruskin. It is called the early hours of, uh, of dawn. And uh, you can see exactly the colors that he is uh, advocating from the Bible and he finds them in nature. And we finally come to William Holman Hunt. This is a self-portrait of William Holman Hunt. And uh, you can see, that, first of all, that he was redhead. 
And just to let you know, two years before he goes to the Holy Land, we have to see what Hunt is famous for or what is he doing. This is called the hireling shepherd. And what you see here is, of course, Hunt is making some kind of a protest against the English church because what he says that the, 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 the shepherd, which is the metaphor for the church or the allegory of the church, is not doing his job, but instead of taking care of the sheep that you can see over here, he's taking care of a nice uh, lady. And I want you to see something else that he's doing here in order to appreciate William Holman Hunt. This is uh, the original place where the painting is hung. Okay, if we look closer at the William Holman Hunt's painting, uh, this is not a very good example. This is, this is better, I think. You can see his... Uh, uh, you, we look at the painting, or I'm trying to look at the painting right now from a technical point of view, and I'd like to show you how he is dealing with colors, with, with real paint. And what Hunt is going or following what uh, Ruskin said is something that is the most important thing for Hunt is truth to nature or to be very obedient to nature and to describe nature exactly as it looks. And what you can see on the hand of the shepherd is you see the reflection of the green color of the grass. And when we look at the detail here, if you look at the, I, I don't know exactly if this slide is good, but I hope you believe me that when you look at the right apple, there is reflection of the red cloth on the green apple. And when we're talking about this, I will mention to you the Impressionists in a minute, and you will see that Hunt is doing certain things in his painting at least 20 years before people like Monet and Renoir, etc. Okay. Another good example, both for, from a thematic point of view and also from a color point of view, is this painting that unfortunately it is not in the uh, exhibition here at the Pushkin Museum. And uh, you can believe me that the size of the painting is about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, very, very small. He did that at the same year that he did the one before, at the Hireling Shepherd, and this is called Strayed Sheep, or Our English Coasts. And if here you see there is a shepherd, but he is not exactly preoccupied with the sheep. There is sheep here, but no shepherd. So he, again, this is one of his reactions against the English church, and he says in a word that there are no shepherds in the, in the church. But if we look very close, and this is really magnification, uh, which is very, very big, but if you look, if you see, if you would see it in London at the Tate Gallery, and you look very closely at the painting, you will see, for example, the rocks here that are a, a symphony of complementary colors. And if we look here, and this is, this is even better, you can see that the sheep are not, we look, when we look at the sheep, they're supposed to be white. But if we look close to what he did, he was painting the white with two complementary colors, which is purple and yellow. And we all know that, let's say, Monet, when he was doing the famous series of paintings of the Rouen Cathedral, you know that each one changes with the light of day, and all of them there are done with these complementary colors of purple and yellow, blue and orange, red and green. And I'm going back to the crazy idea of going to the Holy Land, leaving England and coming to the Holy Land. And there were two literary precedents. One, a book written by Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, that's called The New Crusade or Tancred. And the other book was, done, was uh, written by George Eliot, the woman George Eliot, and it is called Danielle de Ronda. And in both of these books, there is a, there is a uh, a trip or a journey by somebody from England coming to the Holy Land. Okay, Hunt and Sedon come to Jerusalem. And in order to do certain things or to, to make their life much easier in Jerusalem, they met with the British consul there. And the British consul there at the time, his name was James Finn. 
And James Finn was a great admirer for the culture of the Holy Land. And he uh, founded uh, an organization that was called the Jerusalem Antiquities uh, Society. And if historians want to know or to get some kind of an idea of what life in Jerusalem in the middle of the 19th century was all about, they read the book that uh, uh, James Finn wrote called Staring Times. Through James Finn, through the British consul in Jerusalem, William Holman Hunt and Thomas Seddon met with this person, a very impressive person, I think, if you look at his portrait done by uh, William Holman Hunt. And this Edward Monk was uh, a very strange person, or so he was looked at by uh, the, the Jerusalem uh, Christian society, because uh, this um, Henry Wentworth Monk, not Edward, I'm sorry, Henry Wentworth Monk wrote a book about the coming, uh, the second coming of Jesus. And what he was advocating was that he, uh, advocating the fact that all Jews from all over the world are coming back to the Holy Land and only after the Jews will come to the Holy Land, it will be possible for the second kingdom of Jesus. And you can see that Hunt is trying to show exactly the character of this Henry Wentworth monk by showing that in his right hand he's holding the Bible and in his left hand he's holding the London Times. So he makes the connection between the present and the past in the Holy Land. So together with Henry Wentworth monk, Hunt began to roam the country of the Holy Land. And I would like to show you, he painted not too many, but he painted uh, a certain amount of paintings in the Holy Land, and I will talk to you about two of them. Okay, this is the first one, that he has two versions. This is the first version. This is a very strange painting, and it was viewed as, as strange by Victorians or by the contemporary people when William Holman Hunt brought it back to England. And what it shows us is a goat standing on the shores of the Dead Sea in the Holy Land. This is the second version. And what is the scapegoat? The scapegoat was a ritual that is written in the Bible on a certain day during the Jewish year, during the time when the temple was uh, in Jerusalem. There, the high priest would take two goats. One would be sacrificed to God. The other one would be thrown into the desert and uh, uh, symbolically would take upon itself all the sins of the Israelites. And what you see in the painting here, there is a long, long description. Hunt wrote a diary. He wrote it in his memoirs of how he painted this painting. And because I would like to remind you that he was completely obsessed with truth to nature, he had to go to the Dead Sea. So what you can see here on the map is where Jerusalem is today. I mean, it hasn't moved since uh, ancient times. And uh, the Dead Sea uh, to where the scapegoat was thrown or thrown away by the high priests. So when Hunt was obsessed with the truth to nature, he left Jerusalem. He bought a goat in Jerusalem, brought a goat with him to the Dead Sea shore, put the goat on the shore of the Dead Sea and took his canvas and started painting the goat on the shore of the Dead Sea. After 10 days, the goat died and a new goat was brought from Jerusalem just to show you how obsessed he was with truth to nature. But now let us look uh, really at the painting itself, which is also not very big, it's about this big. And look at the, at the, at the mountains there. And you can see that with the colors, you can, you can uh, imagine the time of day. It can be one of two things. It can be the dawn, or it can be uh, the... Uh, and uh, just to... Uh, I make it larger. So this is supposed to be dawn. And I found beautiful uh, photographs in the internet and this is the, Red, the Dead Sea with the mountains of Moab at dawn. 
you can see that the sun is just rising on the east. And uh, this is at dawn. Later on, you can see that the colors are really in nature today, exactly as Hunt saw them uh, 150 years ago. Okay. And you can see how the colors are changing. This is dawn, and this is the, mi the middle of the day. So first, the colors of the sky. And then, if we look very carefully, there is a dead goat on the, next to uh, the uh, rainbow there. I'm not going to make you read because we don't have too much time, but I will just want to remind you of the, uh, uh, the covenant between God and Noah from the Bible. And God says to Noah that uh, there is going to be a covenant between him and the people that every time you see the, the, the rainbow in the sky, that means that God is keeping his promise. And then you have something on the left, which I think, this is my interpretation of it, there is another skull in the water. And uh, it reminds one of the sacrifice of Isaac or the binding of Isaac because uh, there is another covenant between God, but now God is making a covenant with Abraham, father of the, of the, of the Israelites. And if you look at the horns of this uh, animal, this is, uh, this is the sacrifice of Isaac, just to let you know that from the history of art there are many, and there is always... Somebody, something that comes, or an animal that comes instead of Isaac. And the animal that comes there is a sheep, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, not a goat. And one of the Jewish symbols for this covenant between God and Abraham is the horn of this animal, in which it is blown every, uh, how do you say, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So what we have here, in the, not in both paintings, but in this painting, what we have here is the first covenant on the right with Noah. And then we have the covenant with Abraham. And so we have two covenants of God. But this is the new covenant, or this is the new uh, Nova Yazabie. There's something strange that not too many people see on the, on the head of the goat. And this is a red string attached to its horns. And that shows you the symbolism of William Holman Hunt because he is working very, very diligently to find uh, symbolic elements in, as objects to put in his painting. And this is one of them, the red or the crimson or the purpur, as you call it before, uh, string that he put on the horns of this scapegoat. Question okay. is why? And we can see another painting by William Holman Hunt much later. But again, this is called The Shadow of Death. And you can see again that he's doing something that's supposedly very simple, very realistic. This is Jesus at the end of the day in his father's carpentry shop. And he's just, uh, he's very tired and he goes like this. But of course the symbolism is with the shadow because behind him we see what is going to be uh, the cross. But on the floor, there's something made in red. And you can see the detail right here. So this is something that you put, the Arabs, until today, they have a kafiya, or they have this, this piece of cloth that they put on their, on their heads. And in order for it not to be blown away by the wind, they put something that's called an akal. And the akal can be in red, or in white, or in black, or in yellow, or in blue. It doesn't matter. But Hunt chose the akal as if it's just one of those objects in the painting to be crimson. So, if we come back to uh, the text that we read before, uh, uh, the text that we said uh, from Isaiah, that the changing or the transformation of color, if it is in crimson, your sins are, going, are like crimson, they would be as white as snow. Okay, and w this shows us that the story in the Bible that talks about the ritual of the, of the scapegoat doesn't say anything about the string on its head. So this is Hans' uh, invention in a way, but his invention shows you that he is not satisfied only with the Bible. He goes to the Hebrew or to the Jewish Talmud 
which uh, nobody has ever expected him to, to study. Just to go back to show you that all these ideas of Ruskin, of these four holy colors, you can see it in the sky, both in the white scapegoat painting and in the black scapegoat painting. Okay, another painting by Hunt that you have here in the exhibition at the Pushkin Museum. This is called The Finding of the Savior in the Temple. And Hunt painted it, some of it, he painted in Jerusalem, and then he brought it back to England and finished painting it when he was in England. But again, this is something that he's doing in the Holy Land, and uh, uh, I would like just to tell you very shortly what is the quotation from the New Testament that he uh, is depicting in this painting. And the story from the New Testament mentions the fact that uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were supposed to leave Jerusalem. And the parents left Jerusalem, but they, I would say, forgot their son in Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and sat down and had uh, discussions with the rabbis or discussion with the teachers in the temple. And the story goes on to say that then they came back to Jerusalem and when they walked into the temple, they saw their son um, making uh, discussions in, uh, with the rabbis. And this, of course, has a long tradition in Christian art. This is Giotto from the 14th century. We can even go to, to uh, Albrecht Dürer, and he's doing uh, the, the, the argument or the discussion of Jesus with the elders in the temple. And one of the interesting things here, and I think this is very important, of how uh, the discussion is created visually because uh, Jesus is uh, and, the, and the elders there in the temple talk and they, they go one, two, three, four, or they, they count with their fingers or they argue, or not argue, argue is not a good word, but they discuss certain things by pointing to their fingers. And another thing that I just saw yesterday, so I don't have the title here, but this is also at the... Uh, here in Moscow. This is a beautiful painting by Polenov that is doing exactly the same subject that uh, William Holman Hunt was doing, and this is Jesus uh, discussing uh, with the elders in the temple. So again, uh, what we see here is the two parents on the right with Jesus, the 12-year-old Jesus. Uh, uh, his mother is uh, uh, hugging him, and we see the elders of the temple. Now, William Holman Hunt wanted to create, as always, the truth to nature, belief that he had. So he wanted to create portraits of Jews as they were in the times of Jesus, which is 2,000 years before. But of course, he couldn't get people from 2,000 years before, so he was looking for certain types in Jerusalem. And he was following the idea that the uh, Sephardic Jews or the Eastern Jews of Jerusalem resemble the Jews of the times of Jesus. So he could get models for all these old Jews from Jerusalem except for the figures of Mary and Jesus and Joseph. And uh, James Finn is giving us his uh, uh, description of why it happened like this, because Jews in Jerusalem were afraid that this is going to be an altarpiece, that this is going to be a, a, a painting for a church, and they didn't want to become symbolically Christians by that. So Hunt couldn't get models for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and he found them when he went back to England. See here his preparatory drawing for the figures of Jesus and Mary. And these are the portraits of the Jews of Jerusalem. Some of them are very realistic, beautiful portraits. And every single part of Hans painting has a symbolic thing. You see the two, the, the three, I mean the parents and the child Jesus next to the door of the temple. And on the door of the temple, uh, Hunt wrote certain uh, 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 quotations from the Bible. So even on the door, he does something to remind one of the New uh, Testament. And also something that looks very, very natural. You see the, outs the outside uh, of the temple and there's a man sitting there. But if you look at the man, this is also a citation from the Bible uh, showing what the temple was like. Okay. So again, these are the portraits. 
And now, uh, I'm not going to read you the citation again, but Hunt wrote to some of his friends and he said that in order to create the atmosphere, the real realistic atmosphere of the Jewish temple at the time of Jesus in Jerusalem, he had to get acquainted or to learn some of the rituals, some of Jewish uh, rituals. And uh, he did that by meeting uh, prominent people from the Jewish community in Jerusalem. If we look very carefully at his painting, and I circled something here for you, this is something uh, that's called tefillin, uh, which is uh, uh, an object, that a ritual object that um, Jewish men put on their head and their hands uh, every morning when they do the, 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 the morning uh, prayer. And you can see this on the, on the head of one of the um, uh, Jewish characters that you see in the temple here. So you can see this man with the tefillin on his head, but also look at his hands, and it's exactly the same thing that we saw with Dürer, because he's also arguing or he's also discussing certain things with the infant Jesus in the temple. Something else that's interesting in this painting, somebody is holding a glass or a bowl full of wine. So you can see that the old man here is holding some uh, wine in his hand. But Although Hunt wrote in his memoirs that he wanted to understand the rituals of the Jews in Jerusalem, this thing could never happen in a Jewish synagogue or in a Jewish temple. You don't drink wine while you put on tefillin. But these two rituals are uh, very correct, but separately. But it was okay for him to do this for his Victorian audience in England to show that he knows the rituals of the Jews uh, in the days of the temple. Now, just to mention that William Holman Hunt had a very uh, uh, talented wife, and Edith Hunt was also a painter, not as famous as William Holman Hunt, and she did this painting, small painting, showing the apartment, the house that Hunt built in Jerusalem. And this house, by the way, is still there to this very day. Thomas Seddon came with Hunt in 1854 to the Holy Land. And one of the very famous paintings that uh, um, Thomas Seddon did in the Holy Land, you can see it beautifully hung in the exhibition here at the Pushkin Museum. And uh, as opposed to what I showed you with William Holman Hunt, the two stars of the paintings in William Holman Hunt was first an animal and then the people in the temple. What Thomas Seddon was doing, he was practically a landscape painter, and there are hardly any people except uh, just uh, for this uh, shepherd or something, but he, basically he did landscape paintings. So when you look at the landscape painting, sometimes we just take it for granted that it is so beautiful, you see the sky, you see the earth, you see beautiful vegetation and stuff like that. But it is very important to know, if you know the geographical point where the artist was sitting while he was or she was painting this particular landscape. And what uh, uh, Thomas Seddon decided to do is he put himself or he put his canvas at a certain uh, uh, point looking to the west of Jerusalem. And I'll show you in a minute a map and you will understand what I'm saying. But uh, you can see on the hill the uh, wall surrounding the old city of Jerusalem that is still there today. It was built by uh, the, the, the Ottoman Sultan in the um, 18th century. Here is the map. Uh, this is uh, an old map of Jerusalem and you can see the walls of the old city. And I put with an arrow where Thomas Seddon is sitting and looking at the city towards the west. He's sitting in the north but looking towards the west. And also, Palenov was sitting almost at the same place that uh, uh, Thomas Seddon was sitting. If we look closer in, uh, at uh, Thomas Seddon's painting, uh, here, if you look very carefully when you see the original in the exhibition, you can see this thing. This is a, 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 a photograph from the 19th century, and this is a particular place in Jerusalem where you can see some of the tombs of certain kings or, or, or noble families of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus or a little after the time of Jesus. 
And this is how it looks today. It hasn't changed really. So this is a picture of, of how these uh, tombs look today. And you can see even today that the, the place is not uh, with buildings or anything. So it is almost like Thomas Seddon and Polenov saw it in the 19th century. So if we go back just for a minute to uh, Thomas Seddon's painting, the question is why why did he paint this from this particular angle? And this painting is called The View of Jerusalem from the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Because in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, as it says in the Bible, it's going to be the last judgment or the judgment day when the Messiah comes. So this is not only just a landscape, this is a particular symbolic landscape where uh, um, the Christian belief would be that this is where the Lord is going to show himself in the second coming. Okay. Another painting that Thomas Seddon did, again, this is a beautiful landscape, but one would ask why this particular place? And he built himself a tent, and he was living in the tent in this particular area for about two or three months every morning coming out of his tent to paint this well or this uh, landscape next to the well. And this is called the Well of Ein Rogel and it is situated next to a place called the, the Mountain of Evil Council. It is supposedly the place where the, the, uh, uh, the rabbis or the, 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 the Jews decided to, uh, uh, to give Jesus to the Romans. And just to, to, to show you how important this uh, landscape was, uh, Thomas Seddon brought it back uh, to England. And when somebody else, which is uh, another uh, artist that you can see, one of his most beautiful paintings here uh, at the exhibition, uh, you can see that at the top here, he took or he simply copied the landscape of, uh, of the Holy Land and incorporated it into his painting showing the coat of many colors of Joseph. Father Melex Ram didn't have to go to the Holy Land, he simply copied something that his friend Thomas Seddon had from a certain place in the Holy Land, which for Thomas Seddon this was the mountain of, of uh, evil counsel, but for Ford Maddox Brown, he just took it as a, as a landscape, as a background to another biblical story of Joseph and his coat. Okay, Edward Lear, as I said in the beginning, was not a pre-Raphaelite, but it was an ad he was an adherent or an admirer of uh, the pre-Raphaelites, and especially William Holman Hunt. And when Hunt was painting the strayed sheep that I so showed you before, uh, Edward Lear came with him and studied with him, especially how he was mixing his colors for the uh, paintings. I'm showing him to you because he was also, he also visited the Holy Land, again beginning in Cairo and then coming to the Holy Land, not together with uh, Hunt and Seddon. But if you look carefully at this watercolor by, uh, by uh, Edward Lear, I'm giving this as an example, and God forbid not to say that, he, that Hunt is better than him, but definitely because they're different. You would not find here the truth to nature that Hunt and Seddon have in their paintings. This is more of a topographical uh, uh, painting. Okay, and this is Jerusalem by Edward Lear. And again, just to show you where Edward Lear is sitting, he is not sitting where Sedon and Polenov were sitting, as you remember, in the north looking to the west. He's sitting in the east looking towards the west. So you see Bethany there, and uh, Edward Lear also wanted to do a landscape exactly trying to, to, to imagine in his mind how Jesus saw Jerusalem when he came there from Bethany. So all these landscapes are Basically, you can look at them as a landscape, of a, but it is of a particular place, always going back symbolically to the Bible or to the New Testament. Uh -huh. Just to end up with a comparison between them so we can see, again, the emphasis of Hunt's truth to nature. This is uh, Hunt's uh, depiction of Bethlehem. And you can see on the right, uh, Edward Lear, which is completely more general than the very, very intricate way of how Hunt is depicting uh, Bethlehem. 
And when we look at these two paintings, I think the one with Polenov is more like Cezanne, maybe. It is much more modern in a way of more free as a painting. And when it comes to Hunt, this is again the truth to nature, the very intricate, the very, very realistic way that he wanted to depict his landscapes. Hunt came to the, the Holy Land four times. The first time was in 1854, then later on in the 60s and the 70s, and even at the beginning of the 19th century. And he died, if I'm not mistaken, in 1910. And his wife and his uh, son erected this uh, uh, bench uh, in a particular place in uh, Jerusalem, I'm sorry, I, th I thought I had the map, but this is a place that Hunt used to sit and paint the, the hills of Jerusalem looking to the direction of the Dead Sea. So this is uh, just the, the, the um, inscription that they left on the bench. And the bench is still there on the way from Jerusalem to Bethlehem uh, in Israel of today. This is the, the side of it. And this is the I would like just to, to sum up the things that I tried to tell you and say that both uh, Sedon and William Holman Hunt, if you look at their paintings, try to think all the time how these deeply religious Christian artists came to the Holy Land, always thinking about the Old Testament and the New Testament and never seeing something in front of their eyes without, uh, in the back of their minds, all the time thinking about the biblical sources uh, for uh, their Christian belief. Thank you.